Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's virtual program at the Commonwealth Club. My name is Sujata Balaga, and I'm the director of the Restorative Justice Project at Impact Justice. And I'm excited to be your moderator for today's program. This program is a part of the Commonwealth Club's virtual series, and we'd like to thank our members, donors, and supporters for making this and all our other programs possible. We're, great, we're grateful for their support and hope others will follow their example to support the club during these uncertain times. Today, I am more than excited to be talking to Krista Tippett, uh, host of the wildly popular NPR podcast, On Being, and founder and CEO of the On Being uh, Project. Every week, Krista talks to writers, scientists, poets, activists from different faiths and various spiritual inclinations who open themselves up to her compassionate and searching conversations. We'll be spending the next hour discussing what it means to be fully present and leaning into this moment in time, the history that brought us here and the possibilities that lie before us. If you're watching along with us and you have a question you'd like me to ask Krista, please put it in the text chat uh, in YouTube and I'll be asking uh, them uh, to Krista later in the program. So thank you so much, Krista, for joining us. Um, it's only slightly intimidating task, right, to interview the person best known for her capacity to brilliantly interview others, uh, one who's received the Peabody Award for Journalism and National Humanities Medal from President Obama, no less, uh, for her gifts in what I have been tasked with doing for her today. Um, but I've heard from the staff of the Commonwealth Club and others that you are the kindest person and uh, our brief email correspondences leading up to this back that up, surely. So, um, so that puts me at ease and makes me uh, certain to say it's a pleasure to be in conversation with you today. Um, so it is a challenging time to be one coming up with the questions. Um, in preparing for this, I was struck by the title of a dialogue you recently had with your colleague, uh, the Reverend Lucas Johnson, uh, in your Living the Questions series, right? And the title of that was, when no question seems big enough, right? And so there is not a single question that I'll pose in this interview today that holds all of COVID-19 and structural oppression and the murder of black people with impunity and our ever unresolved interlocking histories of transgenerational trauma and violence. And surely nothing uh, well, that I'll say today um, in asking you will imply that you have mindfulness as the quick fix to any of that, right? Um, and as um, much as you and your dialogues are really looked to uh, for the moral compass for so many of us, myself included, uh, there's literally no chance that this Indian woman and this wonderful white woman are going to have all the answers, even if the question could be big enough. Um, so that's not meant as an invitation for us to be sloppy um, or even um, as an act of generosity uh, to the two of us, but more of a simple truth that this is going to be necessarily a partial conversation. Um, so Krista, when this, tip, uh, this topic was chosen some time ago, COVID-19 was pretty much all that was on most of our minds, right? Only some of us we're already steeped on the daily in the other pandemic that has for hundreds of years been plaguing our nation and world, right? The fact that Black Lives Matters is a thing that even needs to be said in the first place. And so I've been thinking, you know, there's no way to ease into this conversation um, because uh, in our nation and the world right now, there is no ease here, right? Um, so, um, so let's start with this. Uh, the On Being podcast comes out of Minneapolis the place you call home, uh, which is the epicenter of this iteration um, of our seeing racialized violence, racialized state violence in America. So tell us, Krista, in the weeks that have followed uh, what George Floyd's brother uh, aptly described as the lynching you know, of his brother, mm -hmm. um, what have you seen as on being's responsibility at this time? Um, and are there things in the past that have prepared you for this moment? Yeah, well, um, before I get to that hard question, I just want to say how happy I am to be here and to be here with you. Um, I think, first of all, I feel called to carry my questions with great humility. 
Um, I think that was the title we gave to that. The living the questions idea is after a, a passage in Rilke's letters to a young poet where he says um, that, we, that we shouldn't rush to our answers if we can't live the answers to our questions. And in that case, if we can't live those answers, we have to love the questions themselves and live the questions themselves. Um, and that's, that's been, you know, that's been a centering point for me for a long time. And again, in this period, you know, this actually, the, the matter of race and healing has been something that, that we have pursued, um, as something that recurs in, in, in the conversations I've had and, and in the work we're doing, um, so I certainly do actually have teachers who've been with me in this time, including, you know, sitting with John Lewis in Montgomery and, and the great civil rights leader, Vincent Harding, who I was so fortunate to interview before he died. And, mm. and I've interviewed ta Coates and, um, you know, Isabel Wilkerson, who told the story of the great migration, mm. which is this story of the 20th century that we've scarcely, of, of the many layers of our history um, that have to do with the racial reckoning that you know, has been upon us, but there is a new awakening. And one of the things I'm thinking, you know, that is the story of uh, 6 million African-Americans who in the course of the 20th century migrated from the South, fleeing Jim Crow, Jim, Jim Crow fleeing the possibility of being lynched uh, to find a better life. And part of that story that I think we don't tell, I know we don't tell, that Isabel Wilkerson started to tell in the 21st century, really the first comprehensive popular history of this is that the welcome black Americans received in Northern cities was not, it was not a welcome, right? It, it was a, it was a, it was a, these were promised to be places of refuge and so I, I'm thinking about that because I, one of the things that I think gets easy for people on the coasts and in the North is to still think of this as a Southern problem. And it's not. Mm -hmm. If it were, things would look much different now. So I also think, you know, Minnesota is an extraordinary state with an incredible political lineage and history and a great sense of public good that I find unusual in America, but it, it, it also is not at all surprising that this erupts in Minnesota or in California. We have so much unfinished business and part of what has gotten in the way is this superiority complex of white people over against other white people. This is a really long-winded way of answering your question, mm -mm. but that's a lot of the kind of reflection that has, it's not that I've not thought about these things before, but you know, I feel like one of the realizations now that more of us are holding is while we have not been actively racist, we have not really been anti-racist either. Mm. It wasn't enough. And we could have also known that. And now I think we're called, not for the first time, but to not turn away and to do the work that is internal and external. Thank you. Um, I'm curious for you what it is that you think is causing this additional shift, maybe on the individual level, and then maybe if we could speak more broadly uh, to the On Being podcast's work, right, the project more broadly. What is it about this moment? And it's not... It's literally not that we haven't seen three back-to-back -back videotaped m m murders or we haven't seen, you know, children being, having the police called on them for selling water in front of their own apartment buildings or barbecuing while black or any of this, right? We've had this constant stream of, of visuals even for the past decade um, on, on this, on this um, 
unending phenomenon uh, since the beginning of our nation, right? But but visually for some time now. So yeah. what do you think it is that's sort of opening hearts in a new way or opening eyes in a new way uh, in this moment? Um, and, I, and I'm asking this particularly to those who had their eyes closed, right? And so I'm sort of mindful about like, who's the audience in this moment, right? And some people may be listening to me like, we had our eyes open, right? And, and so I wanna acknowledge that. And I'm noticing that there are more eyes open now, many, many more eyes open, right? So I'm curious about what that experience has been for you to go back to the question sort of individually and then sort of organizationally. Yeah, I mean, I I really like to take a big lens and pull back. And this is something we do at On Being, and we made this decision years ago, um, and it was kind of a countercultural, countercultural within journalism to make a decision to not be doing breaking news to really be stepping back and saying, what are the questions that are emerging here that are gonna be with us in three months and six months and a year? And what do we need to keep learning? And so, you know, the, that question you just posed, I could go back a hundred years. I could go back, I could go back to this 1960s. I could, um, you know, one way I've thought so much, and I grew up, I was born in the year 1960, which as I, as I, as our world progresses or moves forward, um, and as I move forward in life, that feels there's there's some really important arc between the 1960s and in fact between the unfinished work of the 1960s that I feel like we're picking up now. And we, you know, the simple way I have come to think about it is we changed laws, but we didn't change ourselves. And, and what we see then at a remove of a few decades is that the laws themselves become fragile. Um, but I think also to go back not quite so far in time, you know, I see the Obama presidency, which was such a, an extraordinary, historic, magnificent accomplishment. And, you know, when that election happened, it wasn't just people who'd voted for Barack Obama who saw the magnificence of that accomplishment. Um, but I think that one effect of that presidency was also to surface all of the unfinished work we had to do to be worthy of it. So it's, it's and I know it, and it's, it's helpful to see things in a larger perspective because otherwise it's just so inexplicable that it could be so ugly after it felt so beautiful. But all of that was always in us. And you know, it's actually because of the creation of mobile phones with cameras that we started to see those pictures, right? These killings had been happening. It wasn't even any kind of, that wasn't even a result of, of that presidency or, you know, it was, it, you know, this is one place where our technology has been a terrible gift, um, but, the, the challenge is what do we do with the fact that we see these pictures? And then, but even that, you know, even we started seeing these pictures, we started knowing these names of black men and women, often young black men and women murdered. Um, and we were only seeing, we were only seeing, you know, we weren't seeing everything, um, but that didn't change us either. Something happened Something so extraordinary, and I, I feel like the pandemic softened us, you know? It, it shook the ground beneath our feet. And for as awful as it's been, I think it reminded us, each and every one of us, of, this, of our frailty and vulnerability that everything in this culture works to, to, for us to steal ourselves, to deny. But I do think that it softened our basic humanity, mm. partly by way of discombobulating everything, right? So it wasn't, it's not necessarily a beautiful softening, but when this, the racial pandemic just showed its head again, it landed differently in so many people. I don't know if that's the answer, but that's, that's, that's what I'm 
that's kind of what I'm how I'm trying to think about it now. As you say it, it makes me feel that we were undefended. We were uh, undefended. Which... That's it. That is it. Mm -hmm. So um, why I and so many people listen to you um, is because even in this moment, right? So, um, and, and in these two, the, this cross section of these two horrors, right? That are happening. Um, you look for and to the good, mm -hmm. <laughs> Krista. Right? Yeah. And so we need horizons to look to. Yeah. Uh, we have to know where we're going, right? And so my curiosity is what your practice is in doing that in a way that doesn't uh, produce the spiritual bypass yeah. or the uh, look to the good bypass, right? If it's not a spiritual thing. Um, what, what is your practice in doing this work um, of being able to hold a horizon and not sugarcoat, not spiritual bypass? Yeah. Well, I do look for the good, but I would say, first of all, that is a byproduct of looking for the fullness of reality. I honor the complexity of reality. I want to see the whole picture. And in that picture of us, there is brutality and there is beauty. There is cruelty and there is goodness. Um, I would also say, I like the question of the practice because I, you know, I started out my career a long time ago in divided Berlin, in the Cold, Cold War of Berlin, as a journalist, as a reporter, a news reporter. And I became aware then, and this was certainly an impetus for starting on being, um, that journalism, and really I think a lot of our sophisticated, our serious, I think the academy falls into this trap too, is very sophisticated at analyzing, looking for, uh, and presenting what is terrible, right? Like the, 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 the worst, most inhumane side of humanity. And that lands, you know, evil and violence are riveting in very deep parts of our brains, the brains of journalists, as well as the brains of movie makers and the brains of the people watching. But a question that really um, motivates me is how, is that, is that as goodness is also part of that picture and it's quiet. And, and it, doesn't, it doesn't trip those parts of our brains where our bodies get mobilized to run from it or to attack it. Um, but the question for me is how to make goodness as riveting or to make it riveting because it is part of the reality and because, and this kind of comes back to your question before, what I saw in, in Minneapolis these last weeks is the cameras trained over and over again on the pictures of devastation and those pictures were true. And something happened in this city that I know is happening in cities across the country right now as well, that this landscape of care rose up, populated by young people. In Minnesota, we had a, we watched our white governor who I honestly had never paid much attention to before kind of have, go, he learned some things in public. I watched him correct himself in a press conference. He'd called a group of people protesters and he changed it to, I should say, and he, and he wasn't reading from anything. I should say neighbors and friends and agents of change, hmm. right? I watched mm -hmm. him talk about generational pain that had been inflicted on black citizens, black lives. And these were not words that had crossed his mouth before. So, so what I see unfolding here and, what, I, and what, what that says to me is that that landscape of good 
potential is also unfolding in other places and none of that was covered. Um, so journalism in crisis mode covers what is destructive for us and it does not cover what can save us. It doesn't cover those new leaders and it wasn't just the white governor, it was, it, he surrounded themselves with these younger leaders of color, city council members and school board members and neighborhood organizers who suddenly have risen up, their voices have risen up. Now, the success of like that looking like our future is not guaranteed, right? That needs all of us to keep seeing it, taking it seriously and reorienting towards it. And that's why it, if we're not being shown those pictures, we are all called to seek that out. Because there's, there's, there's what we want to tear down and there's what, what must be torn down and there's what we want to build up and the repair and the healing and the transformation. And all I would say is looking for the good is about insisting on, on taking in both. Hmm. When I think about your experience in, in such formative years, right, in, in Germany, um, yeah. what, a, what a powerful thing. And I'm thinking about um, this long view um, and what, what it is that you see from back then that points us in the directions that we need to be going in, right? And there's, there are these moments where everything seems impossible and then suddenly there it is, right? Um, and I love how you talk about this, um, about that moment where the wall uh, began to fall. And obviously there were things leading up to the beginning of the fall, right? But, um, but there are these tipping points and I'm curious about um, what you see from them that might be instructive for this moment. Um, mm -hmm. And you know what you witnessed there that you might be seeing some similar things now. Uh, this is my mind tending towards hope where this might be, yes, maybe we'll have a national truth uh, commission where we're gonna go back and think about uh, genocide and, and the enslavement of people and all of this. You know, Maybe we're gonna do, when we're gonna have the kinds of historical markers that Germany has uh, today. And yeah. um, maybe, maybe we're, we're pointing in the direction where we would never have a death penalty for the people that we had had in concentration camps, right? It, ever have a death penalty for the people right. that we had enslaved, right? These are basics for Germany when they hear about us. So there was a tipping point um, and, and you were there for a, a major part of that, right? So yeah. what, what do you see from then uh, that, that gives you some hope about where we are now? Yes, well, first of all, I, I had the experience in that part of my life of living in a place with this, you know, living behind the Iron Curtain, inside the Berlin Wall, tanks, you know, decades of history. Seeing in the 80s when I was in Berlin, the, the wall was there. It, it actually seemed more sturdy than ever. Poland had gone into military, uh, military dictatorship, uh, military, what am I looking for? Um, anyway, you know, the, the, there had been kind of an uprising in Poland, which was crushed the year before it came. And um, yet in the years I was there and I was, I was 20, 22, 23, so I was new 22, 23 year olds. There were all these things happening around the wall on both sides of the wall. There was an ecological movement starting. There were illegal, copy machines and church basements in East Berlin. There was a, there was a, there was an artistic uh, cross pollination that was new. And nobody took any of it that seriously. It was interesting, but it didn't factor in the great geopolitical forces that had created Berlin as it was. I, it was absolutely unimaginable to anyone until the wall came down or until people walked through it that night of November 9th, that that could happen. The chancellor of West Germany was out of the country that day. You know, I, I submit that as exhibit A, that nobody saw this coming. There was a lot moving, there was a lot shifting. 
but our imaginations didn't go there. And that has formed me ever after. Now, there is a lot of talk now about Germany and what a model it is for reckoning with difficult history. And, you know, what I want to say about that is that that has been 60 years, right? So, but I, I just want to draw, to connect a dot because I interviewed Jason Reynolds. Do you know him? He's a YA author. He's actually the national ambassador for children's literature at the Library of Congress. Oh, how wonderful. Our, no, I'm going to be our show for next week. He no, but wrote, I'm, he wrote, the, he wrote the YA version of Ibram Kendi's book, Stamped. So he wrote the YA version of the history of racism. Wonderful. And what, what, I, want, what, I, want to, what I just want to say is there was something that happened in divided Berlin, around the Berlin Wall. This is not the only factor, but there was something that happened about the power of human imagination to make something unimaginable happen and of human and of hope. And I don't mean hope as wishful thinking, I mean hope as a muscle. Hope as seeing a possible future and walking towards it and doing that with enough accompaniment around you that suddenly the great geopolitical forces came into perspective you know, at any time after the, the, the fear back then is that if there had been an uprising, the Soviet tanks would roll in. But nobody ever considered what if the entire city, the entire city walks towards that wall, right? <laughs> and, and the border guards, you know, resisted for 15 minutes and then they put down their guns and they walked across with them. It's not that mm. simple, but I'm saying like you're saying when we use this language of tipping point. Anyway, Jason Reynolds. You know, he, if, right now with race, what we are, what we are, uh, what I am understanding, even though I thought I understood this at a deeper level, and I think a lot of people are understanding, it is an invention, right? We made mm -hmm. this up, we conjured it, and then, and look at that, what it says about the power of imagination. We have distorted ourselves, we've distorted all of our institutions, we've distorted our neighborhoods, we've, right, how much we have. Mis been misshapen around an idea. Mm -hmm. And the only thing that I, you know, that you can then follow with that is hopeful and the work of the next 60 years or more is we can, we can conjure a new idea and mm -hmm. orient towards it. As you're speaking, um, the one thing that leapt out at me just really uh, ignited my heart was this notion of um, illegal photocopiers. Yeah, right. And the notion of like illegality, right? And we have to remember like, you know, um, the Holocaust was legal, right? Like it's really important to remember like how we frame those things. And this notion, uh, the other thing that really jumped out at me just now was um, the imagination piece. Uh, so there's so many of these young, amazing, so many in um, Minneapolis, young, queer, abolitionist, people of color, who are imagining, right? And I'm always struck by the capacity to imagine when people's own bodies are on the line, right? Like this is amazing to me. Like curiosity, yes. that openness of mind, that what might be is not something that operates in me when my limbic brain is talking, yeah. right? And so this is like this deep reverence I have. In particular, uh, Miriam Kaba often says from Project Nia, um, in, in, in framing uh, what it is that the future looks like, like this is what we're gonna imagine our way into. Um, and then there are so many naysayers now saying, well, what are your alternatives or what's it going to look like? And um, this, there's something in the way you were speaking about this co-creation that people didn't walk through that wall knowing what the political structure was gonna be afterwards or what any of it was going to be. So. Um, so that's just really thrilling. I don't know if you have more to say about that particular thing, this, this unknowing walking through the wall, right? Yeah, well, I just, you know what, it brings back to me, John Lewis, and he's, he's written about this and said this in the 1960s. And, you know, again, our historic, we've, we have such a, an impoverished way to think about history because we, we see the milestones of the 60s and we don't see the 10 or 15 years of sit-ins and 
bus boycott, you know, that, that everything led up to that, right? And, and, and it's important to see that because, because we have such, we have such long, we have to, we have a world to remake, you know, and we actually had a world, I think we started to understand that we had a world to remake in the pan, in the, when the virus hit. And, and now, and, and it's, it's important that this has surfaced because it's, if we had, if we had started to remake the world and not tackled this, we, we could not, we would not have been doing that. Um, but John Lewis says, you know, you had to live, you have to live as if you, you decide the world you want to live in and you walk as if that, not just as if it can be true, but as if it is true. And what he and his, you know, so many people, yes, Martin Luther King Jr., you know, yes, Malcolm X, but there was just this world of leaders and a lot of them were 17, 18 year olds back then as well. Um, black teenagers whose parents were terrified for them to go to the March on Washington or go to Mississippi and knock on doors. Um, but they lived as if, so there's that, there is that power of imagination and how exciting, what a relief that we get to engage that as well as all the practical tools, right? All the granular things that have to change, but that that is a muscle that is pragmatic. It's not fanciful. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's also really exciting this moment. You hear this expression, the seed never sees the flower. Uh, but it feels like, you know, even in our lifetimes, right, we are seeing the flowering of so many things that were unimaginable. And there's this, there's a real, there is a real hope at this moment. Yeah. Um, I wanted to shift a little bit, if you don't mind, Krista, to um, leaning into this moment on a personal level. Maybe you can help me grapple with some of these things um, in, in my own uh, experience, right? So a part of my experience has been very much um, that it's people of color's experience in many ways of being wrong, uh, wrong food, wrong language, praying to the wrong God, wrong way of speaking, right? Certainly uh, growing up in an immigrant family in rural Pennsylvania, um, I had that experience, right? Um, and in your um, recent dialogue with Resma Merikum, right, that you yeah. put on, on my Resma wonderful, yes. Yeah, really wonderful uh, conversation. Um, where you talked uh, together about whiteness as being the standard, right? Um, and so, and in that, I was thinking about the ways in which um, white folks haven't had to be wrong before. <laughs> um, that's been a part of the privilege, right? And so I'm watching so many uh, really earnest and well-intentioned white people having to be sort of wrong for the first time, right? Yeah. Um, and, you know, being asked, don't tell us how to help you get it right, right? Um, and um, sort of my own experience as a person with relative race privilege, that's also been true, right? Not just as someone who as a South Asian and upper caste uh, Indian is white adjacent and even provisionally white in some settings, right? Um, and then also within the South Asian community, really being called to the task of asking this very powerful question, which is why have I been so invested in the liberation of black people, uh, but I haven't said boo really in my entire career in external work about the oppression of minorities in India, particularly Dalit and Bahujan people, right? As a person of caste, right? So, whoa, um, big wake ups right now and really thinking that my own um, commitment to Black lives uh, right now also requires me excavating things within myself, right? I need to start an Ambedkar study group amongst people of my caste, right? I need to talk amongst ourselves. Um, and so these are all things you're surely hearing, right? Uh, with your staff, um, with uh, the people that you're interviewing. And I wanted to ask you a little bit about your own um, you know, like we've been told, don't take up space with your tears, absolutely hearing it. What are your practices? Again, I'm kind of about the practices. Um, this is one way of, we will get to mindfulness at some point, but there is this practices piece that's interesting to me. What are your practices um, for managing that, that this moment for yourself? Yeah. Yeah, I'm thinking about, um, you know, we, we need better words, but just as much as that, and maybe even more than that, as white people, we need 
better silences. Um, and that doesn't necessarily come easy to me, right? I mean, that's, that's uh, I may be a good listener, but I walk through the world using my words and, and even using my questions. And I, you know, I, my questions aren't, I, I have to question my questions. And um, I think in terms of practices for getting, for grounding myself, they're just the same ones that I have all the time. Um, which are, you know, which I'm more faithful to some weeks than others, um, breathing, you know, breathing and not just, not just med not just having quiet time in the morning where I, where I do some meditation and some prayer, but, but actually these, right now, these days, I'm, I'm often stopping myself in the middle of the day to just take three breaths or five breaths or be quiet and, yeah, feeling the power of breath, which, you know, just as I'm saying that, um, isn't one of the, that's a word, right? That's a breath, the necessity of it, the fragility of it, the, the horror of it being endangered in the different ways we've seen it endangered. Um, so, so I actually think that's seeping into me in terms of and, you know, Resma Menachem, who, who I did interview, um, you know, I, I'm very, I'm really helped by a lot of the science, a lot of, because we're learning things. So, you know, he, I've been hearing a lot about the vagus nerve, which he talked about in terms of racial trauma and, and even the trauma that, that we, the trauma that we all carry in our bodies around this. Um, and, the, you know, there's the, this vagus nerve, which is kind of a new thing that we never saw before. And you know, in, in the way we divided our bodies up, even medicine divided our bodies up, but there's this, what Re Re Resma called the soul nerve that connects breath with vocalization, with eye contact, with the gut microbiome. So when I breathe now, I'm, I'm and if, during the day, just stopping, I'm not just thinking of, you know, I, I, there's so much coming in. There's so much, there's so many connotations to breath. Um, I also do something that I call, I call meditative reading. Um, you know, I sometimes just have 10 minutes in the morning of this dedicated meditation prayer time. I often like to have a book that it has to be a beautiful book, but it doesn't have to be a spiritual book. Um, so recently I've had James Baldwin's um, uh, The Fire Next Time as my, and I will just, I will just, it will be a book that all, that to take one paragraph or two paragraphs at a time. Um, and I, and I, and so I think that, you know, and it, we're so many people are reaching to books now and to reading and it's, it's so wonderful. And what we're reading in these books, like James Baldwin's The Fire Next Time or How to Be an Anti-Racist or, you know, all the books that are now on the best, New York Times bestseller list, which is so astonishing. Um, they need more than a quick read. So I think this meditative reading is deciding what I want to take in and then really letting, taking it in, in kind of, you know, one breath at a time. And I'm, I'm finding that very, I don't, I don't know what it's doing for me, but I, I think that those ideas accompany, they get in, they get under my skin in a different way. They get inside my breath in a different way. And, and I walk through the day with that. I think that's what comes to me with that question right now. Thank you. Um, I'm thinking about protest signs and you're speaking and I was thinking about protest signs. Um, and it's been interesting, this dance um, and staying with this notion of like, um, we're gonna get things wrong when we lean into this moment, right? Yeah. Um, and we have obligations to do things and we have to be really thoughtful about how it is that we do them. And I think about both this constant call for some of us to sit down and to listen and to, and, um, and to be silent, as you said, mm -hmm. um, and um, also a, a really powerful protest sign that I regularly see, which, regularly see, which is white silence is violence. Right. And so there's this right. really interesting dance that yeah. we're doing, right? Um, and um, and by we, I mean those of us with race privilege, right? Um, relative race privilege in relationship to um, 
Yes. And to, yeah. So this is, um, this is, this is something that I'm just curious about that, that dance, right? Like, uh, because sitting out isn't an option, right? Um, and so that leading in again, so I appreciate uh, the practices that you named. Um, I also think that there's something about, um, for those who are listening in, uh, who come from sort of lives in which being the smart one or being the one with the answer is the way we've learned to feel good about ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, so asking for a friend, this question, <laughs> right? <laughs> what, how do we um, work with that uh, in relationship to this moment, right? I mean, there's so many of us who are called to have the answers, right? I really eschew being called a restorative justice expert because I don't actually think that's a thing. Um, I think we're all experts and at the same time, right? There's a way in which I'm held up in those ways. And so, um, so yeah, it's sort of, that's sort of the basis of the question, this balance. Yeah, I appreciate that. I appreciate that that challenge of the word silence and because what I mean is silence that is present, right? Um, and uh, and I, 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 I stop myself from saying silence that is listening, but it, it is listening. But, you know, listening is not just about being quiet. Listening, deep listening. Listening is about being present. And that kind of silence is a side effect of the presence. And, and that listening also has vulnerability in it. It wants to learn. It wants, it wants, it, it's ready to be uncomfortable. Um, yeah. And I, and I, yeah, I, I hear you about, I, I, I feel like right now, those of us who, I mean, it's like, I even, it, you know, I feel uncomfortable. I, I would not want anybody to be listening to this hour and think that I think that I know what I'm doing right now, or that I am some kind of expert, or I figured it out, or I feel um, satisfied uh, I'm thinking it through and I'm kind of right now I'm like thinking it through out loud. I've had a lot of great teachers. I'm turning back to them right now and I'm where I can with my, with the show, like I have a platform where I can offer some of their voices up and I can, I can learn again. Yeah. Yeah. You, um, there was another question I had had for you really about breaking down this process of listening that you speak about so beautifully, not just being quiet, right? Um, or even hearing, but that being present. Um, and I think that ask you like, who are some of your greatest teachers in that kind of presence? Um, what does that presence look like? Um, yeah and feel like, what is it experienced like for you and, and Yen? So honestly, the, I mean, certainly a lot of the people I've interviewed manifest that, but I actually think, I think of elders in my life, which for me, because I don't not, I don't have this great, I didn't have all these elders given to me. You know, I, I wasn't handed those grandparents. Some people have that grandmother. I didn't have that grandmother. But I've always had older friends. I mean, even when I was in my 20s in Berlin, I had female friends in their 70s. And, you know, honestly, the person who comes to mind for me when you ask me that question right now is not someone famous, but it's, it's my friend Nell, who's lived a long time and um, has been so present to life and she's had a real life. So she's had terrible things happen. She's had lovely things happen, but what is notable is how she walks through all of it and how she insists on joy again and again. And um, she makes beauty in really simple ways. And so, but what I think is important about that too is that I think we all, I think we all have, we, we all can summon that person they're also really embodied our memories of those people who are wise whose presence has changed us um i mean i think that the 
the measure of a wise life and what makes wisdom different from accomplishment or knowledge, you know, somebody who's very knowledgeable is, um, is that it is that wise wise lives the way we think about them the way we measure them is the imprint they've made on other lives around them and you don't have to look for the person who wrote the book or the person who is a leader of a movement you know or who changed the world in some visible way that got that got written about thank god you know and and if we did the world would never change because it's 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 all these things happening on the ground in particular communities in families and lives and neighborhoods that that makes the change that builds the change thank you i want to know your nell better <laughs> <laughs> she's 94 wow yeah and i haven't yeah. seen her for a couple of months physically because yeah. she's yeah. Vulnerable. Surely. Um, so um, I, I, we, this topic was advertised as mindfulness. So I feel like we have to touch on it really briefly okay. at a minimum, but I feel like you are throughout, right? And then I know, you know, you don't see it as sitting on the cushion and being, you know, um, but I, I would love to know a little bit more about, in particular in our very brief uh, email correspondence, you, you intimated that you have some reservations about the overuse of the word, but you know, that yeah. it has some usefulness. And so um, I'd love to know sort of where you land on that word and what you feel like it offers at this moment. I, I think mindfulness and, um, and certainly mindful, mindfulness meditation is, um, is a spiritual technology that has, is ancient and it has offered itself self up to 21st century people and it has been transformative. Um, I, I also think I, I, I have been including, I've, you know, I, I spent some time at Stanford and in Silicon Valley um, in 2019. And, and I've also been in places where you get the feeling that if we can just get meditation rooms everywhere, it'll all be good. And, and there's, 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 there's so much that's in that, including a, it's a kind of new form of bigotry about the fact that a lot of, there are a lot of different ways that there are so many different forms of contemplative tradition across our traditions. And, um, but I think more importantly, even with religion and spirituality in this culture, we, we do this chin up thing, right? Mm -hmm. And we think that if we can just think about it right, and of course that's not what mindfulness is about in the depths of the practice. But I, I worry about the word and I just think it needs to be part, both the practice and the word need to be part of an ecosystem of us not just being mindful, but getting connecting up our minds and bodies and hearts and in fact, in, you know, I think in the poly, it's like, there's this, there's the language of the heart mind, uh, but it doesn't, it doesn't make it into translation. And, and we really need that. Um, I think mindfulness can be practiced superficially. I think, I think meditators can be great narcissists, just like people who practice other traditions um, can fail to live up to their deepest promise. And, and I think that alongside that kind of practice, which really has been transformative in, in so many spheres, um, we, for example, we need some of the tools that we need to, to walk through this racial reckoning. Mm. It's, a whole, it's a whole different way we need to examine ourselves. Um, I'm interested, I'm interested in the in inner life, and outer presence in the world and how those interact and how we can nurture them together. Um, and our spiritual traditions don't always call us to that or they can be practiced in a way that they don't call us to that. And I just don't have much patience <laughs> when that's not happening. Thank you. Um, I really appreciated that answer. So I want to, um uh get to a few of the audience questions um so i'm going to be scanning those really quickly please bear with me um so 
We have one here. Krista, you talk about the work, both internal and external. Can you talk about specific actions that are the work? I read about people saying uh, to read and learn more and to contribute to organizations that help improve life for people of color. Um, are you thinking of that and what else? Um, so I don't want this to be a cop out, but I don't think I, it would be right for me or reasonable for anybody to tell anyone else what the, what the right action is in your life, in the neighborhood you live in, you know, in whatever spheres you are active. I, I really think what we're each called to is to be holding these questions to be, and it, and I don't think, I think many of us don't know what to do next. And so that is the question, as Rilke said, that we have to be living right now. And, you know, we talked about imagination and I actually do, I, ha I do have an experience that holding questions like this works. If you take this question itself as a practice and you start walking through the elements of your day, your interactions, how you look at your neighborhood, how you look at your kids' schools, how you spend your time, your workplace, your work, um, your interactions in the most ordinary places as you go about your day. And you hold that question of what is my next step? It, it, it shows itself. Thank you. I personally did not think that that was a cop out. Okay. And I think it really folds into like listening to what others say need to happen now, right? When it's related yeah. to their lived experience. So thank you. Um, next question is, are you still writing your book, Letters to a Young Citizen? <laughs> have you, have recent events changed any of it? I am writing my book. Actually, I was supposed to go on a writer's retreat in March and I was supposed to go to another one in May and they both got canceled. I have this book, which I intend to finish this summer. Um, some of the things we've been talking about here are in, in it. it. I'm not thinking about it as letters to a young citizen anymore. I think that was a place to start. But, um, you know, we are all, we are all turn of century people. And boy, has that taken on a new, all kinds of new, connotations in the year 2020. And in some ways, I think we're all young citizens right now. So that's how it, it kind of, it broadened out. Uh, we've touched on this a little bit, but I wanna let this, um, this person frame it in this particular way. Um, I believe you recently posted, and perhaps I read about it elsewhere, about holding more questions than answers. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have ideas how we sit with the questions without becoming passive enablers? We've talked about it a little bit, but if there's more you wanted to add on that. Uh, well, maybe one way to do that for sure is to not keep them to yourself. You know, when we talk about... Um, having better conversations and being part of communities or the dialogue, we often frame it around what's the hot button issue we want to discuss, right? What's the, you know, and it's, yeah, the issue, it's issue based. So, so one way to think about that is to do something that's question based. And actually, if you're pulling a group of people together around a question, you might be able to get a much more diverse group of people than you could if you get people who agree on what the issue is and you, you probably end up getting people who are more like you, even if that's not what you want. I think across our chasms, and there are so many, we're carrying a lot of questions in common. So I think, I think pulling people into that process and letting that be a discussion um, is a way of keeping it alive, like making sure that, that, that your question holding is embodied and that there's some accountability about, about it being a practice towards what do I do next? What do we do next? And there's one more um, from the listeners that how do you balance the slow contemplative, oh, there's two more. Um, 
yeah, well, let's start with this one. How do you balance the slow contemplative qualities of mindfulness with the need for urgency in the current moment? Beautiful question. I, I don't, you know, I, I, I know that people often say to me, uh, <laughs> oh, you're so serene. And I've always said, talk to my children, right? <laughs> um, I can I can be serene. I can I'm also actually a very intense person. I, I wouldn't, you know, I'm very I'm very a very intense person. So like I have a personal experience of holding both of those things and honestly the only thing that makes it better is getting older. <laughs> you do you do learn. You learn to balance yourself out. So I can't remember who I was. I met somebody recently and I just thought I couldn't say this to him but I kind of wanted to say just you know what, in 20 years, this is going to be okay. <laughs> but something I think civilizationally is that this is another way we need each other. You know, we need, and we, we're really seeing this now, we need the impatience of youth. We need people who say, this is ridiculous. Mm -hmm. How have you been living this way? We mm -hmm. are going to make it different. Mm -hmm. And we need that that can be fruitfully accompanied and leavened by people who've been living in their bodies for a while, who understand the complexity, not who are saying, let me tell you how to do it, but let me walk alongside you and let me hold, you know, Thich Nhat Hanh, just to get to meditation, he talks about when he does walking meditation, he recommends holding the hand of a child when you do that. But it will, it will just, it will, it will change the, you, what your body is doing. So. I feel like that's an image for how we can turn to each other, walk along, accompany each other. Yeah. Now, those of us who are impatient, those of us who are fighters, those of us who have some calm, those of us who have some perspective, those of us who have younger bodies, those of us who have older bodies, um, nobody has to um, do both perfectly. Um, and if we, you know, as we create community around all of this, I think that's where the balance is, not in, you know, it's just this American thing of doing it perfectly and I do it myself. No, that's gotten us where we are now. That's not how we want to live. So we have a couple more here. Let's see if we can do it in our remaining time. I have one last one I'd love to sneak into, but um, let's see what we can do here. So, um, do you think that acknowledging, honoring, and allowing grief is important? And what would that look like as individuals and as a society? Honoring grief? Yes, I mean, and that's probably something that we have so much, we have so much grieving to do now, and it's probably something that has gotten lost or it's taken a back seat to the different kind of energy and crisis that has followed a time of a lot of loss and not just loss of people. I mean, loss of people, but loss of certainty, what felt like certainty, loss of a, sen a sense that you knew what the future was going to be, loss of economic capacity. Um, it's not something we do well as a culture. Um, a, a, a group that I'm a, of young people that I'm really fans of. They this group they call it the dinner party, which they these are young young people millennials who just realize that, and they were they were young people who lost someone, and they realize that there's no place to talk about this in this culture. You're supposed to get over it. Um, so I'm I'm cheered by some of the ways, uh, and that's that's a good group. There are others. Uh, there are things called death cafes, which sounds so odd, but it's another way of saying, hey, this like part of being alive is the reality of death um, and the reality of loss. So an emphatic yes. And I think there are places to turn. And, and yeah, we're going to have to have, I think we're going to have to have, I was talking to some rabbis the other day about lamentations. Within Judaism, there's this notion of lament and lamentations, there are rituals for mourning and from, for passages that entail loss and that also where we still are called to go on living. Um, and I was suggesting them, or we, they were, we were having this conversation about, could they offer some of this up 
to our culture or to other people outside that tradition, again, as spiritual social technologies. Um, Thank you so much. I think um, we're down to just a few more minutes together. And I have a question that I would like to close with. Um, so, um, you know, I think about when I listen to your podcast, there's so much storytelling in it. Mm -hmm. uh, and that just really speaks to my heart as a restorative justice person. And I think to all of us, right? And um, I love this quote um, from her book, Wired for Story, where Lisa Cron says, story as it turns out was crucial to our evolution more so than opposable thumbs opposable <laughs> thumbs let us hang on stories told us what to hang on to mm -hmm. and so chris i'd love to know what are the stories that you've been hanging on to uh, these days and maybe some of the storytellers uh, that you think it would be good for us to be hanging on to Oh, I think of uh, Rachel Naomi Remen, Dr. Rachel Naomi Remen, who said stories are the flesh we put, the flesh on the, on the bones of the facts of our life. Um, well, for me, I, the stories right now are, is the fullness of what, is, what it is to live in Minneapolis right now. And I kind of think in neighborhoods and communities and cities across this country, um, there are the quiet stories that no camera is shining on, but where really the world we want to inhabit is, is, is it, we, we're seeing what it could look like, if not, you know, if just that. Um, it was, you know, when I, I was also watching buildings burning, not that far away on TV and on my computer and it was so important when I finally went over there and saw how people had um, just poured out to take care of other people. And just yeah, a lot of young people kind of with brooms and mops and pails, just getting right inside those burned out buildings and cleaning them up. And these, these local political leaders who I'd never heard their names, who were so articulate, so brilliant, so compassionate and practical about the work of building and repair and, and not building and repairing so that it could be the way it was, but that so that it can be a different world. Those stories are all around us. And, and if there's a discipline or practice, it's it, 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 is, it is looking, looking for the good. There's this biblical phrase of developing eyes to see and ears to hear. Mm. And when you look, yeah, you, you will find so much that we can live by. Well, Christy, you're making me think of the beautiful art now in downtown Oakland. I mean, all the answers are there in the art yes. of the beautiful people who are going out and beautifying um, with their wisdom uh, what it is. So we should be walking around and looking. Taking that um, in and it's as serious. It doesn't, it doesn't deny or make any of the bad things better, but it is as serious mm. as that destructive narrative, right? It's the generative narrative that we can help, mm. we can help make. Thank you so much, Krista. I think we've come to the end of our time together today. So our very special thanks to Krista Tippett, uh, who is the host of the On Being podcast for joining us today. Mm -hmm. uh, we'd also like to thank our audience for watching and participating live and thank you all for your questions. Um, if you'd like to watch more programs or support the Commonwealth Club's efforts in making virtual programming, please visit commonwealthclub.org slash online. I'm Sujata Balaga, wishing you all wellness, peace, and justice. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.